Collaborative Faculty Forum. We're blessed to have Dr. Ansel with us today, who I will now read a brief bio about. Uh, Dr. Aaron Ansel is a cultural anthropologist with a regional specialty in Northeast Brazil and topical emphasis on local politics and the language forms people use to conduct politics. His work has largely focused on patronage, patron-client relations, and non-ideological forms of polarization in small-town Brazil, as well as government efforts to dismantle patronage factions in the name of fighting corruption. More recently, Ansel has turned to the dynamics of political polarization in the U.S., designing a software aimed at helping people signal their receptivity or lack thereof to critical confrontation in particular situations. So we are very uh, excited to have you with us today, Dr. Ansel, and we will leave it in your able hands to take us forward here. Okay, well, thanks very much, Bradley, and uh, thanks to Emma Tienda de la Vega for uh, conveying the invitation and to Max Stevenson for for hosting me and, you know, all of you for your for your interest in my work. Um, my my plan today is to try to make sense of a particular pathway that my work has taken, which has led me from the ethnography of Northeast Brazil, a small town in Northeast Brazil, um, and with a focus on political economy, to the uh, advent of a software, as, as Brad mentioned, uh, aimed at helping people have hard conversations. It's a kind of strange thread that I want to trace today. Uh, and my plan is to talk about political economy in Brazil and the language of self-governance for the first part of my talk, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then I think we had planned to do a Q&A following that. And then after that, I would do another bit on political polarization leading up to the, the software issue I just alluded to. Does that still work, Brad? Okay, good. All right. Um, so I'm going to frame the through line of my work in terms of the talk forms or speech forms that people use to govern themselves. This is a kind of uh, ongoing curiosity. Um, how do we talk? How do we configure discourse when we're trying to um, self-govern? And of course, in the kind of enlightenment derived model of public deliberation, we get from, among others, Jürgen Habermas, this idea of an ideal speech situation um, that is a kind of forum, maybe a parliamentary forum, in which all adults are welcome and all equally have the right to offer propositions and to critique the propositions of others and to respond and defend their propositions. And the idea is that our ideas do battle with one another so that we don't have to. Our ideas kill each other so that we don't have to. Uh, and when we engage in this kind of deliberation, uh, we're supposed to frame our ideas in these very general ways, um, universal principles, moral principles, practical principles, um, stepping out from the provincialism of our particular cultures, of our particular identities, holding those in abeyance, or the term in, the, in that literature is bracketing. We're supposed to bracket our particular identities, um, our class interests, our racial identities, uh, our patron-client relationships as they might exist outside the discursive venue, all of that we're supposed to leave at the doorstep when we enter into a, a kind of realm of, of depersonalized rationality. It never really works, um, but it is a kind of guiding model in, in Western um, kind of democratic theory and ethos. Uh, and um, it's, it's quite foreign to the places where I've done my ethnography and to many of the other places where ethnographers have studied issues of self-governance. Um, it's particularly difficult to bracket identity in situations where you're dealing with small scale communities, where the people who you're speaking to, deliberating with, are 
your relatives, they're your extended cousins, they're your employers, you you buy your soap from them, you want to marry their, their junior sibling or something like that. Um, they're your in-laws. It's very, it's very hard to critique somebody's ideas without worrying about the ramifications that such a critique will have on how they're going to relate to you outside of the forum of interaction. Um, and so people devise other ways of doing the business of self-governance, other, other types of talk. Um, that are more conducive to their social formation. And so that's been an interest of mine. Um, and I want to sort of talk about how that interest has developed a little bit. Um, let me uh, let me share my screen to give you just a kind of potted version of my early research trajectory. So if you follow if you follow the blue arrows on on this little slide here, they begin on the upper left with the election in 2003 of the left-wing progressive uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva um, from the Workers' Party, the Partido dos Trabalhadores, uh, um, a union working-class union leader who founded this party, who helped to topple Brazil's military dictatorship, uh, and who, after sort of 20 years as the leader of this opposition party, was finally elected president, um, but um, was elected after having moderated his once radical ideas, such that the World Bank calmed down, the International Monetary Fund calmed down. He even got the blessing of the George W. Bush administration. That's how much more moderated he had become. Instead of socialism or a break with the United States, a commercial break, he advocated a new kind of revolution, which would be a revolution against hunger. He said if he could feed Brazilians three meals a day, that would be enough. Um, that would be a revolution. And so he launched a flagship anti-poverty policy, very complex, multifaceted policy called Fome Zero, which translates into zero hunger. Um, and it was a national, kind of a nationalist policy, as you can see by the kind of this icon, this logo here is a sort of riff on the Brazilian flag. So we give up the color, the red, the communist red, for the green, yellow, and blue of the, the nation. And he pilots this, this complex program in the region's northeast. If you follow the arrow to the right of the screen, you see a, a map with the Portuguese phrase, região nordeste, the, the nine states highlighted in red are the poorest states in Brazil and the most rural some of the most rural anyway. Um, the, the, uh, you can't quite see it here, but this, was, this region was the entry point for the African slave trade. It, rem it remains a, a more Afro-Brazilian area uh, than much of the rest of Brazil. Its coast is a uh, sugar plantation, or at least historically was the backbone of the colonial sugar economy. And it's inland or hinterland, or in, in Portuguese, the called the Sertão, was the, the um, called the corral and slaughterhouse of the colonial economy. Beef and leather goods sent from the dry areas of the hinterlands to furnish the coastal sugar plantations and the rest of the country with these kind of agricultural and uh, um, cattle inputs. Once kind of, these were semi-feudal uh, large land holdings. They were worked by enslaved persons and freed persons. And even after uh, slavery ended officially and these large estates kind of broke apart, there remained a uh, very extreme income inequality and, and class disparity, even as the region's uh, rural population became smallholders rather than tenant farmers. They were quite beholden to the once lordly um, ownership class, and that beholdenness expressed itself in patron-client relationships, patronage, which I'll kind of define and work with in just a minute. But anyway, the, the program, the Zero Hunger program, was piloted specifically in a couple of municipalities which were deemed the poorest of Brazil in one of the poorest of these nine northeastern states uh, called Piauí, and it's there on the bottom right. Um, and in particular, one of these municipalities, I call it Passarinho because I, I give it a pseudonym, 
um, it was a kind of laboratory for numerous zero hunger policies that got worked out between 2003 and 2005. And, uh, and so that's where I went to live um, as a young man, um, living uh, in these rural communities, which were the kind of target communities of numerous anti-poverty policies, all under the aegis of this left-wing zero hunger program. And I wound up writing a book about it, uh, Zero Hunger, political culture and anti-poverty policy in Brazil. So one of the things I argue in the, in the book is that zero hunger, this anti-poverty policy was not just an attack on poverty, but was really an attack on rural patronage culture itself, uh, a culture deemed undemocratic or anti-democratic. And here I've defined patronage for you as vertical reciprocities in which high status figures channel material benefits to lower status persons in exchange for loyalty, respect, votes, bellicose campaigning, like, you know, fists up against the other side, that kind of thing. And it's also, it goes by a number of names in Brazil and internationally. Internationally, it's sometimes called clientelism, patron-client relationships. Nepotism is a cousin of this. It's often seen as a species of corruption. In Brazil, it's called bossism or coronelismo, colonelism, the politics of the colonels for historic reasons we won't discuss. And um, if you can see here, this little kind of cartoon from the 1930s, um, it says, and the next elections will be from the cabrestu. And the cabrestu is the thing that a cowboy holds on to. It's, oh, excuse me, it's the bit in a horse's mouth. And so the idea is that the 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 politician is leading the voter to the polls the way one would lead a donkey or a horse by the bit. That is to say, it's a kind of characterization of the the kind of violence of the politician elector relationship, the asymmetry of that relationship, and the kind of stupefaction of electors who are induced to vote for their patrons, um, either by threat or from material inducements like shoes or food. And so this is a long-standing concern by elite um, educated Brazilians that the country will never be modern so long as voters uh, don't think about the general well-being of, of the polity and instead, you know, vote only for buy-offs and this kind of thing. And so that's what they were attacking uh, through the through this uh, policy. Um, but of course, the policy wasn't officially organized that way. It was officially organized into a set of helpful subprograms, like like these Bolsa Familia, this cash card, very much like a welfare card that poor families, poor women especially, uh, received monthly cash stipends. Very successful. On the upper right, you see a kind of white structure in the middle of the of the kind of uh, arid uh, household. That's a cistern. And so one of the zero hunger policies was uh, one million cisterns. They outfitted rural households with these 5,000 liter water containers that captured drinking water, um, captured rainwater through runoff of the roofs. Um, and this was remarkably successful from the standpoint of provisioning basic uh, um, potable water. There were also forms of community based development projects in the lower right you have a brazilian kind of technical agent inside a village chapel doing a community diagnostic with villagers uh, this is an afro-brazilian village in pasadena municipality this is in connection with the un fao the food and agriculture organization in the in the lower middle these are this is a women's um uh, community garden cooperative that was part of the zero hunger program and then on the left, um, you see a chicken coop with a reporter in blue jeans. That's Larry Rotter from the New York Times and his camera woman there. The chicken coop project, which uh, I wrote about in the piece that I think Bradley may have circulated, um, that was one of the World Bank, joint World Bank, Brazilian government, small scale development projects that uh, was rather ill-fated. Um, and one reason that it was ill-fated is that what the state was trying to do was to create forms of village-level self-management where previously there had been none. Uh, previously, forms of, say, self-rule and the talk through which people governed themselves 
uh, really half rate happened at the family level uh, and the inter-household extended family level and often was layered in and is still layered into other activities like agricultural, collective agricultural activities is of the sort you see uh, depicted on the right. This is the farinada, the processing of the manioc flour and, and the manioc root into manioc flour. And so um, it's in these kinds of forums where people bat around ideas about their family, how their families should relate to other families, feuding, um, the kind of micropolitics of the village, uh, which really kind of um, capped out at these at these multi household extended family units, not the whole village, which consisted of multiple extended families. There was no village council. Um, there, there, there was nothing of the sort that one associates with Eastern Europe and and those kind of supra family public spheres. But it was kind of implanted in um, in the late 90s and then reinforced by the Lula government through its development projects as these um, kind of well scrubbed, uh, educated urban Brazilians and sometimes internationals arrived in these villages, said, we've got a great thing for you. Here's some, we're going to do chickens and we're going to help you work together to breed chickens and, and you're going to become better people for it. You're going to become, you're going to build solidarity and you're going to realize your class-based alliances and you're not going to need these patrons anymore because you'll have each other uh, and you'll sell these chickens and eggs on the local market and you can share the wealth and develop yourselves this way. And um, the, the problem is that the activities that were required of these rural people to undertake these projects uh, were very difficult for them, not from a technical standpoint, but from a kind of social standpoint. They involve forms of coordination, which again, were very alien to them. And uh, they required of them activities like building your own family chicken coop, which uh, which were concerning, threatening to them for reasons that um, the development types had a hard time understanding. But they were slow to build these chicken coops um, and I just want to share with you from, uh, this is just a quick excerpt from the piece that uh, Brad circulated. Um, I want to share with you why uh, they were hard and threatening. So you have Moisej, the development type from the city, arriving in this community chapel where there's this newly founded collective organization that's going to govern the chicken project. And he says, I've been walking around to your houses and I see your chicken coops are not done. You'll finish them. I'm not worried. These things happen. But tell me, what are your problems? I'm talking too much. I want to listen to you. Let's go around and ask each of you, how is your chicken coop? What state is it in? You know, just the foundation or the brick walls up or whatever. And you get things like what this village man said. Uh, this is an excellent project. I'm very grateful to you, right? Engaging him as a patron rather than Okay, uh, the rains did not come, and we all the rain we the rains did come. We all had to go to the fields, so we didn't quite get to the chicken coops, and and so there's a kind of not just a sort of excuse making and a kind of um, expressions of gratitude rather than diagnostic information transfer regarding the state of the chicken coop, but also an emphasis on collective sameness. All of us here are poor. All of us suffer from the, the scarcity of the rains on our field. Um, and that was uh, that was a kind of informational brick wall for the um, development organizers. Uh, and it wasn't just a difficulty that these rural people had when those outsiders were present. They When they left, I was there. No, None of them were there. And I was... Of course, I'm an outsider and I'm very white looking and I kind of look like these development types. But I played the fool sitting on the floor playing with the cats or, you know, just pretending not to notice anything when I was in these village chapels. And still people had a difficult time talking with one another about the states of their chicken coops. Instead, they engaged in these sorts of genres of collective suffering, which I labeled drought murmur in the piece that you read, um, we're all, you know, the rain, maybe God will bring the rains, maybe not, my field is bad, my field is bad too, this sort of thing. A de-emphasis on the, the, the differences in fortune and wealth 
among the villagers and a, and a foregrounding of, of similarity of suffering. Uh, and so as I as I start to understand why they were so committed to this these genres of talk in this new kind of public forum, I quickly realized that um, part of this had to do with the fear of appearing either ambitious or envious if one revealed fortune or revealed exceptional misfortune. Um, and so the, the key here is that someone would say, if you speak like that, or if you don't do that, the winds will turn against you. And what the winds bring is evil. And in particular, they bring the evil of other people's envy. Um, and so when people would build their chicken coops, they would put these cow horns on them as they had on their um, houses and on their fields. They would introduce these cow horns to their chicken coops, and the cow horn is a prophylactic amulet that protects one against the evil envy of another person, the evil eye. Um, and so there is a kind of link between the anxiety that another person's envy can destroy your wealth, on the one hand, and the reticence to talk, the bashfulness to express information about one's personal wealth, on the other. Um, so this put them at a kind of dilemma because if they if they engage in the kind of explicit talk that makes visible differential wealth and luck and rainfall, then the then um, they're inviting other people's envy, and, and, and which is destructive of their uh, livestock, destructive of their crops. Um, but if they don't, then they fail to implement this collective project, which could be a real opportunity for economic improvement. And so they're caught in this dilemma um, around the, the instantiation of some kind of Habermasian deliberative uh, genre. Um, it, they're kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't. And their reticence to do so is sort of deeply embedded in local categories of wealth cosmological uh, concerns about the deadly power of envy and so forth. And so that was my first foray into these kind of local ideas about, about language. And um, I'm going to stop my share here because it's getting in the way. Uh, and I'll just sort of wrap up this first part of my talk by, um, uh, by mentioning that I took a real interest in thinking about the other genres that were there happening on the ground in, in Pasadinium, which were genres of self-governance and genres that where I could see the kind of tension between um, the ethics of patronage and kind of peasant self-governance on the one hand, and on the other hand, rights-based new democratic ideals of the sort that the Lula government sought to introduce. And so I looked at, I've got a number of articles that look at things like hospital waiting rooms and charity auctions and kinship blessings and the kind of talk that happens when candidates visit electors in their houses during the campaign, promising things and corruption rumors. And so these are all kind of genres that have captured my attention because analysis of them, close sociolinguistic analysis of them, reveals the tension between the patronage-based modalities of talk and the kind of emerging rights-based modalities of talk. Um, and I would just like to give you a very brief example of how those two things can be woven together. Um, a few years back, I did a, a piece on kinship blessings. Every day when you greet a senior kinsperson for the first time, you greet them by asking them for a blessing. Blessing uncle, blessing father, blessing mother. And then they respond in turn as a kind of pair part ritual. May God bless you, my son. May God bless you, my daughter, and so forth. And good people do this. Bad people who are on too contaminated by urban ideas don't do it. And so during a campaign, um, you have a, a politician who is now invited to go on community radio and talk about his policies, like a very strange and unusual thing. And there's a call in on the radio show and it's from his nephew and the nephew's in the opposing faction. And he says something like, um, 
What state deputy will you ally with in the ne next election, given that in the last election you changed deputies four times? In other words, you're fickle. It's a hard question. It's a hostile question from his nephew. And he responds, or he's not, and again, he's very new at this. He's on the radio now. He responds, I will respond to you, Marcelo, with all the respect that I have for you as my nephew, okay? My deputy is the one who helps me to implement my social assistance in the municipality. My doors are open to receive your visits, which are not always daily. You can come there. I embrace you because this question is normal, my son. I am blessing you and embracing you and adoring you. This is normal. Thank you. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that when you see invocations of blessing happening in these new, very kind of democratic fora for deliberation, what you're seeing is a merger of patronage hierarchy. I bless you. You can visit me with discourses of civility, merging that with civility talk, like the bracketing of identity. You can disagree with me. You're still my nephew. I'll still give you the blessing. We can argue, right? That's we can bracket that and I'll and um and do this business of critiquing one another. And so it's a kind of performance of forward thinking democratic identity emerging through a kind of patronage genre of hierarchy, blessing others, blessing your junior kin. Um, and so that's the kind of um entanglement, verbal entanglements that I'm very um attuned to. Uh, in my work. And uh, let me stop there for the first part and just see how folks want to react. Feel free to unmute yourself if anyone has questions at this point. Hi, thanks uh, for giving this talk. Uh, we we spoke about your piece actually last week, and it was a really generative conversation. Um, and I, I think I think these ideas about like that the tension within discourse and language are really are really fascinating to me as well. So I guess I, one of my questions would be: Do you think that you talk about this tension um, between the sort of like more Habermasian ideal, right, and like the which presupposes like like bracketing or like equality or something like this versus hierarchy and I, I think I think about this like even in our own context where it's like every day I'm interacting with people who have some kind of authority over me or or perhaps under me like if I go to Starbucks to get my coffee you know may, maybe me giving them the tip is similar to like an elder giving somebody a blessing or something like this but just sort of like in the in the different formations so i'm just curious if you think that hierarchy is like an inescapable function of um of, of uh human relationship or or democracy or if there's if it's something that should be sort of like challenged uh because i know other some other radical thinkers on democracy want to destroy hierarchy right they see that as like the, the villain I'm, I'm thinking of like anarchists in particular um, but yeah, so I'd be curious what you think about that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think when you're talking about, when you're conducting ethnography of a culture of a people, um, I don't think there's any escape from hierarchy. Um, and there, and, and this is hierarchy understood as say differential possession of, uh, valued traits, even when you have anarchists or socialists arguing about equality, they're often, and forgive me, I don't mean to be disparaging, but they're often making claims like our faction is more egalitarian than your faction. I've seen this quite a lot. Our, our development scheme is far more participatory and grassroots than your development scheme. And so there, of course, the value of egalitarianism can be, it's rankable. It's, it's, because it can be differentially embodied and so more to be more egalitarian is thus to be positioned higher up on a hierarchy of egalitarianism any value that can be parsed differently can become the basis of hierarchy and people are doing this all the time but i don't think that means that um if we think about hierarchy as like i defer to you because 
you're my my senior i i'm i must be wrong and you must be right i think that's a very specific um embodiment of hierarchy that doesn't always have to be present i think there might be a tendency for that as people worry that defying powerful others can bring consequences on them but i do think it's possible to create the right sort of incentive structures and discursive conditions where people can feel rewarded for disagreeing sensibly and respectfully with others even those positioned above them though i do think um, one is always swimming upstream when one does that. I think that it's very unnatural, um, achievable, but a very counter-entropic thing. Habermas's discursive bracketing is very counter-entropic. I think it's always under threat of the, of its own, you know, dismount dismantling. But yeah, that's the best I can do. Is a very uh, important question. Thank you, Professor. Answer. Um, my name is Marcel, uh, a PhD candidate in uh, PGG, Planning, Governance, and Globalization. You, I read in one of the one of the slides that uh, local self governance talk had never existed at the village level, only extended family. And then I'm curious to know what alternative to self-governance talk was in place. And, and secondly, uh, how did the absence of self-governance talk at the community level impacted uh, that, that group or that community we, we're talking about? Yeah, good. Um, so I tried to gesture to some of the self-governance talk that was intra-household level. So like multiple adjacent households connected through extended kinship they did a kind of self-governance they um it embedded in the kind of agricultural cycle um aside from that um beginning in the 1970s there were the um, base christian communities the the kind of liberation theology derived uh, village organizing that vatican ii undertook to create some of that structure at the village level with these local chapels um but those were um, kind of decimated by um, Cardinal Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict, in the 1980s. Um, and so they kind of petered out. But the more, um, I think, pointed answer to your question uh, would be that instead of, if you would, horizontal modes of community self-governing talk at the village level, there was a kind of um, fractionation that happened where problems with other families or problems with collect with with um village level resources like a contaminated well would be resolved by um a vertical relationship between a household or an extended family you know series of adjacent households like a compound and their preferred patron politician at the municipal level mm -hmm. maybe a an alderman or um or a mayor uh, and so this is kind of critical to what the Workers' Party understood themselves to be doing, which was a replacement of those vertical problem-solving ties with horizontal problem-solving ties. Um, so that was part of the sociological imagination of the, of, the, of the progressive state. Anyway, I hope that suffices. Yeah, thank you. So would we say that the absence of this kind of horizontal um, interaction among villagers is what gave more power to the patronage or more, um, yeah, I'll call it like that, more power to the, this patronage link between the politicians and the villagers? Good, yeah, no, that's that's a really important question. I mean, that's the story that the Workers' Party government was telling. Um, I think there's validity to that story, so yes. Um, I think, however, there are caveats to that because one thing that patrons want to do is grab an entire village and bring that entire village into their constituency. And so, so long as um, they're united in a political sense as adherence to a faction, uh, then the patronage formation can actually bring people together. Um, and there's good literature on this. Um, but at another level, um, the patronage depends upon those um, 
those unities being unities in uh, followers in support of a single patron, not a unity in which, say, people consider the proposals of rival politicians, um, not a unity that kind of pre-exists um, factional identification. Um, and so some of the literature suggests that that the that the kind of it's the fractionation of families at the village level which enables patrons to cherry pick um, support and then once getting a foothold they try to expand and create some kind of horizontal unity but it's a unity under their name um, not a unity not a solidarity that proceeds and, and exists outside of the patronage relation um, but it's a very it's I hope that does it justice it doesn't but I hope that's points to some of the complexities with that in that your question um entails thank, thank you professor thank you doctor yeah Aaron in in purely materialist terms um clientele politics I think often was about scratching each other's back you'll bring us a health clinic you'll bring us x y and z if we vote for you right um on the other side of the coin I'm hearing too that the new form of politics I'm just making making sure I understand the what the complexity exactly was here in kind of in sociological terms. I'm also hearing you say that good stuff was coming in material terms into the new arrangement as well. You potentially could have chicken coops. You could potentially have uh, material benefits coming in the Bolsa program and so on. And so the real question was, if you like to put it this way, a transition from forms of cooperation is that even accurate or familiar interaction that had themselves been in, in place so long that it was hard to move out of them? It was hard to imagine moving away from them to this other ideation, right? And that was really the problem. Yes, um, that's right. Okay. I mean, the, there's that. That's a general as a general kind of framework. I think that's perfectly that's perfectly good. We can nuance inside of that, but that's a good architecture you put up. Okay, Aziz, you had a thought. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, first of all, it was a great pleasure to listen uh, to a cultural anthropologist uh, after a long time. Uh, I think uh, I think that anthropology provides. Uh, white board and unique perspective on human nature uh, i want to talk to you uh, about your approach uh, to methodology uh, i studied cultural anthropology at istanbul uh, when i studied uh, anthropology i meet uh, two main parad paradigms uh, or approaches uh, functionalism and uh, structuralism uh, i was reading uh, claudio levi strauss uh, and Malinowski frequently, uh, but uh, after uh, I thought that uh, these paradigms or approaches uh, could not answer the questions uh, in my mind, uh, I decided to do a doctorate, a PhD in political philosophy. I discovered Foucault uh, and became uh, interested in uh, post-structuralism. Uh, so, uh, can we say that cultural discourses that uh, don't seem rational uh, actually have a political rationality? I mean, each cultural discourse has a function and uh, is uh, not absurd, uh, can we say? Uh, uh, are you functionalist uh, like Malinowski or uh, more uh, you want to, you, you want to discover structure uh, universe uh, universal structure like uh, uh, Strauss uh, yeah I, I wondered your approach your method methodological thinking oh well um yeah thanks for that um I've been accused of being a functionalist, um, in particular in relation to the essay that you read. I've been accused of, um, you know, talking about the the coherence between evil eye belief and wealth forms and and discursive forms, and in that way, you know, um, giving further furtherance to the project outlined by uh, Radcliffe Brown in the early twentieth century in Britain. 
Um, I think I I think I'm gonna uh, cop to that actually. I think I'll I think I'll answer in the in the affirmative, um, even though it's very out of fashion. Um, and I'm also I'll, I'll also cop to being a kind of French structuralist um, at moments in my in my work, even though that's out of fashion. Um, because not not in the sense that I aspire to a kind of universal grammar of of binary oppositions. I I, I think that's at some level ridiculous, but I do I do think that um, people tend to organize their world symbolically by um, in binary terms, and I gravitate towards the post structure. I'll get to that in a second, actually, because your question is very apt for the second part of my talk. But um, um, polarization, right? Um, but um, I think that I draw on the post structuralist, the part of the post structuralist tradition that looks at how these kinds of dualities that people tend to construct get messed up um, or repurposed. That is how they're inserted into historical time rather than being these kind of ossified, enduring features. They're never ossified or enduring. They're always interactive. Um, but still, that doesn't mean to say that people don't create binaries to understand their world. They do um, all the time. Um, and uh, and so I find those older kind of outmoded traditions uh, useful because they, they provide insight in, into the way people are striving to order their worlds. And I and I kind of found them after I found Foucault, and I find them actually now a breath of fresh air um, because I'm I have grievances with the with Foucault and the postmodern tradition. Among them, I, I I think it doesn't provide much insight um, uh, ethnographically, um, as I think it uh, some claim it does. Um, so that's there. I'm I'm a kind of dinosaur. I'm a relic of a of an outmoded time. Okay, thank you so much. Shall I proceed with the remainder of my talk? Uh, and switch gears to polarization, if that's all right. I'll be quick. Um, I, I want to uh, read from a, a publication by a colleague of mine in Brazil, Moacir Palmeira. He writes of the political season every two years, the municipal political season, that the political season represents the moment in which factions are identified and exist in open conflict. It's in this period when municipalities divide themselves in a manner rarely seen in larger urban centers, the distribution between the factions of the very physical space of the town, and one sees prohibitions in relation to the frequenting of bars and pharmacies and barbershops and some, all the public locales controlled by the adversary faction. It's a polarization delimited in time and within the limits of this time, it's more radical than can be imagined, end quote. Um, let me give you a, a little bit of a sense of uh, what this polarization looks and feels like. You see on the doors of people's homes during campaign season these stickers that people post, and they're, they're propaganda stickers that politicians circulate. They have them printed locally, and they contain their political party number, their slogan, their image, their name, information about their alliances. And what's, what's uh, interesting about them is... Um, um, that when people walk by a home that has one of these stickers posted or more than one sticker, they get very tense. Uh, they associate the posting of these stickers with a certain kind of elector, voter, uh, what they call a sick elector, doanshi. Other synonyms are fanatical or impassioned elector. And they associate the sticker with a, with a kind of talk that's caustic and haranguing, and they call it, they, they make a yapping sound at their own ear, and they say, hey, 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 that's the sound that they, that's the kind of metalinguistic term they use to code for the kind of talk that draws them into conflicts that they don't want. The sick voter is the voter, it's a kind of critique of patronage from within patronage, it's a critique of failed patronage. It's a, it's a, a voter who doesn't rationally assess how generous their politician is. Rather, they're in love with them the way people are in love with seducers um, or with false prophets. Uh, they're, they're people who are seduced by these Don Juan characters who then the next morning leave them forever. That, that sexual metaphor is very common. Um, 
And so people have stopped using these stickers or, or they've largely um, declined in their in their use because the the sonic uh, landscape, the, the soundscape of the municipality during the campaign season has become intolerable to people. This is what polarization means in in this uh, uh, in this part of Brazil. It's uh, let me just in the interest of time jump to a, a contrast that I think is is useful. It's different than polarization as we think about it when we think about left right polarization. It's different because it's cyclical. It's not permanent. There's no permanent left or right. You're not permanently at war with people. You're at war with them during the campaign season. And then the election happens and all the politicians are bums again. They're all crooks again. It's like drought murmur. All the divisive language collapses back into a unifying language of collective um, disadvantage and lament. Um, and one of the reasons why it's not permanent is that there, there's no differentiated criteria for a good politician in this part of Brazil, the way, say, we know it at the national level in American politics, where, where if you're on the right and I'm on the left, we really have quite diverging criteria for what would make a good president. Um, in fact, we have different lifestyles that we associate with the right and the left. I, as, as late as yesterday, I can, with my undergraduates, I had them classify in right or left, conservative or liberal, um, things like wheat bread or white bread, pulpy orange juice or no pulp orange juice, uh, e earrings or nose rings, and they uniform tortoise shell glasses or metal glasses, and they uniformly put these on the right or the left in the exact same ways. Um, so we we have not just policy or ideological. Uh, divisions, polarizations, but these other kinds of cultural polarizations that are, that are kind of taken into tow and which have a relatively permanent um, standing. It's very different from a patronage polarization system, which reverses itself after the election, um, precisely because we all agree as to what constitutes a good politician, generosity and life force and magnanimity and all that, availability. All we disagree about is which politician is the most generous, the most, et cetera. The ideology is not a marker of differentiation. Um, and so I, this, this distinction between the cyclical patronage polarization and permanent ideological polarization has captivated me. And it's completely unnoticed by anthropologists um, who are, uh, as um, uh, our colleague was just noticing, the people who have studied polarization since the structuralists told us that there are the wife givers and the wife takers, the moon people, the sun people, the interfluvial people and the alluvial people, all of this history and intellectual machinery that we have at our disposal to study polarization and we're not using any of it. Um, so I want to be part of the inaugural study of the ethnography of polarization. And in particular, the question of what happens when people polarized in these cyclical patronage ways get colonized by these left-right kinds of permanent ideological polarizing discourses. How do these mesh and, and so forth? Um, and I'm also interested, and I'll wrap up with this, I'm interested in how um, people who want to escape polarization can be helped, um, help to do so. Uh, that is, people who want the freedom to, to enter into a kind of deliberation um, when they want to, but not to face the haranguing, intrusive quality of um, acrimonious talk. And so inspired by my work in Brazil and by just being a citizen in a polarized uh, context in the U.S., I, um, I developed a, a software, which I, I uh, put through as an invention discovery at Virginia Tech with a team of uh, colleagues called uh, Receptivity. His name is not on the slide here. And Receptivity was going to be an, an um, start off as one of those uh, ex extended reality things, you know, the augmented reality where you've got your fancy glasses and you see other people having a red light, a green light or a yellow light above their head. But that didn't really work out. So we're starting much more modestly with this um, website, web server based interface where 
you can talk to somebody, say on a Zoom call or in a classroom discussion about something polemical, and you can communicate whether you're ready to have people disagree with you and be in a kind of contested critiquing mode, or if you just want to find common ground with somebody else um, on, on a topic, you can indicate your degree of receptivity with the other person through this kind of red, green, yellow signaling system. Um, and so I'm actually rolling this out right now in my multicultural communication class, uh, just as a kind of exercise and what a potentially depolarizing software could look like. Um, and uh, um, let me let me just stop there. And uh, I think that's the end of my story. Uh, I'll be delighted to give any comments you have about it. I feel like this would be helpful for dating and stuff too. Um, but I, I'm curious about about how you how you executed this as a pedagogical approach, and like um, if you have any advice or if we can try it ourselves, like with and stuff like that. Um, and then I, I had a second question. This this question is a little more um, uh, provocative, but I, I'm I'm curious. There's there's sort of a, a tradition I would call it like agonistics or antagonistic politics like coming out of like Gramsci and stuff like this that actually sees polarization as a good thing um so I, I was wondering if if you wanted to kind of maybe speak to that where it's like you, an example that I learned was in environmental political theory if you're having let's say an upstream hegemon is dumping poison toxic waste into the water and the downstream hegemon or sorry the people downstream are getting poisoned they don't come together and talk about it. They, you know, they kill each other or they, or they fight about it or, or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious what you, if you have thoughts on that too. Yeah. Okay. So I just got into my, uh, my, my receptivity thing. If you, I put it into the, the chat, the link to it, if you want to, you know, log in and, and, uh, and enter the, um, the session number zero, zero one, you're welcome to do that. Um, as far as how it's playing out in my class, I've had my team has been um, facing some technical difficulties, and so it's been slow to actually get moving. So um, it's been it's been a challenge here. I'm in green right now. I don't know if you can see this, um, but um, so I don't have too much experience actually making this thing work in discussions. Um, that's still very much in, in process. Um, as far as your, your other question, I think there are contexts where polarization could be useful and frankly, contexts where deli deliberation is not the right way of thinking about politics, where politics should be agitational. Um, I think there's a place for marching and protesting and that's not deliberative. And, you know, um, I, uh, I do think that that's, there, there are times when that's uh, important, but I, I think the virtue of um, deliberative politics and the vice of polarization um, is the epistemic failures that come with it. That is, when, we, when we're polarized, we tend to think about politics as a kind of battle in which if we have a weak dimension in, in our, among our ranks, you know, as if, you, if you're a general, you've got, there are going to be weak spots behind your lines, you cover them up. You don't reveal them to the other side, that's crazy, that's treason to reveal the weakness in your own ranks to the enemy camp. If you think about politics that way, and people do, then whenever your adversary points out something, um, a deficit of your own argument that you could use to course correct effectively, your first instinct is to deny it. Um, that's, a, that's a problem if politics should be also a truth-seeking, a, co a cooperative truth-seeking venture. Um, and, and so I, I guess I think about deliberative politics as the kind of default politics and kind of agitational politics as a politics of exception that's necessary in its exception sometimes. Uh, so uh, can we think uh, polarization uh, as binaries, uh, binary system, I mean, binary opposition system uh, that rebuilt itself. That reboots itself? Uh, re re rebuilt, uh, reconstruct uh, itself. 
it's a binary system uh, like uh, uh, yeah well in the brazilian context there is a cyclical rebooting of of these of these binaries um because in the interstitial time between elections social relationships change people get married they get pissed off at their neighbor they get disappointed in their candidate and all of that will come to a head when it comes to who you're going to vote for and align with in the next election so there's a kind of the election is a kind of ritual of purification or or it's a kind of expression uh of all that happens socially in the in the intervening time. And so in that sense, there's a kind of reboot. It doesn't reboot the whole system, but it reboots where people are fit within the system. Um, I don't know that we have a reboot mechanism built into the kind of left-right ideological polarization. Um, although political scientists do talk about realignments every 20 years, um, but that's um, beyond my, my field there. Thank you. Aaron, you know, what's fascinating me, to be honest, is the kind of antecedent question you just raised, which is um, across Latin America, as you pointed out in the beginning of your talk, we have clientelist politics. Um, what's fascinating me is that you're suggesting in the Brazilian context, the way your argument just now um, underscored it, that somehow the conflict implicit at the moment of election just goes away. The polarization just kind of goes away and we go to the antecedent condition of they're all, they're all crumb bugs or whatever, right? Um, that's very interesting. I don't know that that's true in Uruguay or Colombia or Chile or other countries in the, on, the, on the continent, but um, I guess I'm really struggling with why is that exactly? I mean, well, there do you are have insights into why that is? Well, there are some sociological reasons why that's the case. And, and of course, it's important to distinguish between the kind of public discourse of they're all humbugs from retaining your private binary, uh, or I'll call it dyadic relation with your patron, which right. you might preserve, even though you walk away from it grumbling that he didn't give you enough. But once somebody wins the election, the spoils are divided within their faction, right? The, the, the other side is frozen out. So they're going to be pissed off right? uh, and pissed at everybody. But then inside the faction, you're also going to be pissed off because the spoils are divided unevenly. And there, are, jealousy, there are jealousies. Uh, right? I was the main lieutenant and I, my family didn't get the job and the municipal job belongs to me and all that. So there's all kinds of internecine kind of warfare that happens inside a faction, which then has the effect of kind of rehumanizing the once sanctified politician who was sort of elevated to messianic status right before the election could do no wrong. Now they're brought quite a bit down a few pegs as, as it turns out, they're disappointing everybody or most people within their factions. And so it's, it's that kind of structure of disappointment that I think leads to this kind of, oh, they're all humbug type stuff. And very, very interesting. Very good. Well, we have reached 3.30 here. Um, so our hour is up. Did you have any final comments or questions for us, uh, Dr. Anso? Well, I really appreciate your questions and thoughts today. Um, they're very provocative and they really cut to the quick of, of my of my main concerns. And so thank you for um, for hearing me out and, um, you know, for being interested in the software. And I'll, uh, if you're interested in, in uh, following up, I'm happy to follow up with you. And um, Hopefully you'll hear, you know, more from me once it kind of gets really up and running. Well, thank you so much for your time today.